Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, it is Thursday night, almost eight o'clock. I'm starting just a minute or two early because I want to share this into my group, and um, I want to make sure that I have the extra minute to do this correctly. Um, so hold on one second. If you're watching this, uh, well, hopefully you'll be able to watch it from my group in just a second. And here it is. Okay. Share to Homeschooling Hub. I actually have you do have a, quite a few steps. Okay, it's sharing. Great. Yay, thank you. For those who are watching the replay, welcome. And what an exciting night. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, play topics. So I'm really excited for this evening. Um, and for those who are catching me live, it's Star Wars night. Yay, Star Wars. Um, those who don't know me or don't know me well, I'm Jill Wolf, learning specialist. And I help homeschool parents to plan meaningful experiences to awaken the learn in learning. Um, I want to help you overcome curriculum fatigue and planning exhaustion and feeling like you have a shriveled um, creative muscle. And I, and I want you to be excited and feel invigorated by um, the ideas that I can bring to you to use to have meaningful experiences. Um, it's so important to be a learner in the 21st century. And understand what it means to be a learner. Understand what um, it means for me about how I learn. And the best way to do that is through meaningful experiences. And meaningful really um, is when it connects to you. And what better way than to connect through play? So this is our series using play to improve writing. It's been, we're on episode 14, Star Wars. If you haven't guessed, I am excited and love Star Wars. Um, let me grab a little, of course I need some coffee, right? Because I don't have enough energy. But it, it's just been one of those days. I'm looking at myself in the camera and I'm like, oh, I look older today. But hey, you know what? Star Wars keeps me young. So, Okay. So first, I got to tell you a little bit about how much Star Wars, what Star Wars has been to me in my life. Um, I was six years old when the first one came out, and this was the first movie that Dad took me to alone. It was just Dad and me. It was our thing. Um, I was the oldest of four siblings, and so the others were too young to even understand Star Wars. So he took me, and we sat there, and I was just mesmerized by 1977. I'm sitting in there. So that tells you how old I am, what your eyes were. <laughs> anyway, I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, wow. Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, Chewbacca. I never said Princess Leia. I never got excited about Princess Leia. Um, I know she was beautiful, but at the time, I was more mesmerized by the male heroes. And I don't know, maybe it was because I was a little girl and they were like my dad, but maybe there was something that they did differently with her, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, but I sat there and I loved it. And then it was over. And in those days, there was no streaming. You couldn't buy the movie. So unless you saw it in the theater and then soon it was gone, it was gone. And I remember, oh, I can't wait. I want to see the next Star Wars, next Star Wars. But it was three years. And back then that seemed like forever. And I remember, I think it was at the year and a half mark, um, what they did back then was leak little parts of the next storyline to keep you excited because they don't have enough shot to do previews yet on television was the only place to advertise. And um, there was nothing else really. I mean, a couple billboards and a still shot. But um, so they covered things in magazines and they leaked little parts of the story. So I remember when my dad came home, I remember exactly where I was standing and exactly the moment when he said, guess what, Jill? Guess who is Luke Skywalker's father? Darth Vader. Oh my gosh. Of my entire childhood, that's one of the most vivid memories was that moment. So seeing Empire Strikes Back, seeing Return of the Jedi, those were just huge, huge, huge times of my life. In fact, um, when I turned, I think I was 13 in junior high, and a girlfriend of mine, her family had 
somehow come up with a black market copy of the Star Wars movies. Now, let me tell you, black market copy back there was someone had snuck a video camera in. Now, those things were humongous, right? So they have this big, huge thing sitting in their lap. I don't know how it got in there. And trying to shoot on the screen, so it's doing this. And it's not clear anyway. So what I was watching was almost all static, but I could hear the lines. On occasion, I could get Han Solo's whole face without it being messed up. And whenever I was sick, whenever I was down, I'd go sit and watch those three movies. And I just ate them up. So when the prequels came out in 2000, man, I was like every Star Wars fan just thrilled for it. Um, so I'm going to guess that if you're around my age, like 30s, 40s, that you grew up with a bit of Star Wars. But then there's a the next generation that grew up with Star Wars, and now there's a new one. So Star Wars has some real long-standing excitement and stories and worlds and I remember they had book after book after book that was just other stories in those worlds sometimes it involved the characters and sometimes it had all different ones and so it was just a uh, it was more than a franchise it was an, it was an empire no pun intended so when I talk to you about what you could do with Star Wars to improve writing there is such a wide range of things that I'm gonna give you tonight I'm gonna give them to you really fast um, I'm going to write Star Wars up here, but I'm not going to stop to write all these down. What I will do is I'll write them down afterwards and take a picture and post it because I, I don't want to slow down to write everything because I've got so many ideas for you. Um, there's just so much you can draw from in the Star Wars empire to do some writing about. Um, and so I want to make sure we get to that. So there's my little history with it. We're going to jump right in now. So I have, uh, one second, let me grab my marker. Because I, I should have drawn this up here before for you. Star Wars. There it is. There's my back. Sorry. Okay, Star Wars. There we go. Um, like I said, I'll fill it all in for you later, but I at least want that in the background to remind us that that's what we're looking at. Okay. So look at it. Here's my notes. I've got so many ideas for you. It's awesome. Okay. So we're going to start with... Let's start with story. I always start with story. I think that's a, a great one. Um, each one of the Star Wars movies, and now there's eight, have a storyline. And yet they also have a storyline that goes through all of them. So similar to when I talked about Harry Potter, you got the same thing. You got seven separate stories and a storyline that goes, a through line that goes through all of them. So there's some things you can do with um, if, if your child is only is like has a favorite movie, then stick to that one. If they like the whole franchise, the whole world, then definitely um, try to involve more than one story in this. You've got some very interesting arcs. So here's my things with story. Um, there's certainly some analysis you can do, but I'm going to save that for analysis. Um, you could write backstories for some of the characters. Now, just recently, I think the end of May, the movie came out called Solo. It was Han Solo's backstory. And there was such a love for Han Solo that they decided, hey, let's let's tell his story and write it. And um, so you guys can do that. So what's another character they really like? Yoda. Like how did Yoda get to be this revered Jedi Knight? Um, you know, who trained him? I don't, I don't know that they ever tell us that. Um, and so where did he get his training? And, um, who were his mentors? And what was the force like when he was learning? I mean, he's 500 years old plus. So, you know, 200 years, 400 years ago, um, what was the Star Wars world like when Yoda was learning to be a Jedi? Great opportunity for a backstory. Um, they give you a little Chewbacca's, but he comes from a whole planet and world that I believe in number two, um, they show you a little of, but you could write his whole backstory. Like, did he have a wife? Or when he ran off to, um, you see what I'm saying? Like you could take any of the characters and that, that they haven't really given you the depth and breadth of, which is most of them, and write a backstory for them. Now you could write it as, as just um, straight running text like, hey, Karen, it's Star Wars night. Yay. Um, anyway, you could, in doing the backstory, you could just write it in running text like here's my character and 
just invent, very creative. What was their world? What happened? You could write it as a story, or you could just write it as like some notes or bullets, but just be dreaming up the backstory for a character. Um, you could also write a standalone story that's about other characters that we haven't even been introduced to in the Star Wars world, which is what I hear they're doing. Good old Disney. You know, they exploit everything for every dime they can get. And I believe they have a new trilogy that they're working on developing um, that's going to have the same world but a whole new set of characters. Okay, same idea. Um, so they invent characters. Now, keep in mind, Star Wars has characters that are very alien, all sorts of different looks, feels, all these planets, all these different, the way they dress, the way they talk. Um, they do all have, what's interesting is um, the same kind of human traits in terms of love and uh, challenge and hardship and overcoming obstacles, um, those who are evil and cheaters and those who are, you know, helpers of the oppressed. So they still have those character traits to them, but they can invent all sorts of characters and write their own standalone story. Um, they could do journal entries. This one's interesting. I always find this one really interesting because it requires the writer, your child, to take on a different perspective. So if I'm writing, let's say I'm going to write the journal for the new character, Ray, and I'm going to write a journal, and let's say I'm going to do some entries before she ever met uh, BB-8 and engaged in this world, and what would some of her journal entries be like when she was, um, like if she was reflecting back on the first time she met Kylo Ren and had to go up with against him in the forest, what was it like to work with Luke Skywalker? So you could write journal entries like she was at the end of her day writing some things about what she felt and what was challenging for her. Now, these new movies have given you great depth into these new characters, like amazing depth. J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson, the two writer-directors, amazing, amazing guys. And so you have so much to work with. Um, but you could do journal entries. Maybe it's of Kylo Ren. That would be an interesting one because you've got someone who was the um, offspring of a Jedi um, or offspring of the daughter of a major Jedi and the uncle's a Jedi. So he's got all this natural Jedi power and he's under this tutelage and he's, you know, he's being trained to be on the good side, but somehow there's this little part of him and they allude to his struggle and that's how Snoke got him and won him over. So if he were writing journal entries, what would be his angst early? And then what's his angst later? Like he hates Luke Skywalker at the end of that number eight. And why does he hate him so much? And where's that coming from? And why? And, and so, but write it in the form of a journal entry. Um, you could rewrite scenes or parts of movies that you don't like. So I'll be honest. I didn't like the prequels. Um, I felt that they were not, that the characters themselves were not given the depth and breadth that the Star Wars world deserved. Um, Anakin Skywalker, he went from being this totally dedicated Jedi that was, you know, he had a streak for sure. Up oh, the door's opening. Hold on one second. I think one of my doggies was trying to get in. Anyway, um, and he's married, Padme's pregnant. Now he's in hiding from some of this. So there still is this side of him that is in the shadows, but he goes from good guy to willing to kill young Jedi, like in a day, 24 hours. Like that transformation to me never felt legitimate. It never felt really deserved. So that's something that were I to do any these exercises, I would figure out how can I rewrite that? What would I make it that turned him? What would it have been? What would it have taken to dri drive him to that kind of evil? That's what I would rewrite. Um, some people would rewrite Jar Jar Banks. They don't like him, so they would rewrite, okay, I'm going to come up with another character. So I'll take this scene and I'll take out Jar Jar and I'll add my guy. And then what would it have played out like? Um, so you can do rewrites of the story, pieces that you didn't like, characters you didn't like, transformations you didn't like. Um, so that's all some of the story ones. All right. Um, 
descriptive. So I'm going to kind of go to now I'm, I'm going to do three levels that get more sophisticated in the kind of thinking required. So I'm going to start with descriptive, discuss, move to comparative, and move to analytical. Okay. Um, descriptive, discuss. You have, so because I like Star Wars, I have all these Star Wars books. Um, here's one called the Character Encyclopedia. Uh, now you see, <laughs> it's hard, it's in reverse. Which finger is Okay, so here's Padme. She's in one, two, three, the prequels. But then there's Han Solo from four, five, six. So clearly this spreads one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And like they have every character and they describe where they're from. Let me see this. It describes a character, where they're from, what they're known for, what they kind of contribute, like a data file on them. Um, it shows their costumes. It takes them more, less from the filmmaking perspective and more from the character perspective. And I mean, this has like a hundred pages in it, a lot of characters. So something like this, if you had a book like this or picked this up at, or, you know, checked it out at the library or whatever. Um, I think I got it at a garage sale for like a dollar. Um, over 200 heroes, villains, and many more. So you could do some description of a character. So I go in here and I use this like an encyclopedia, like a resource. And I learn about this particular character, and then I write about them. I describe them. Now, I'm not to use exactly all of this text. I have to paraphrase to describe these. So I could do this about characters. Um, I could do it about the different planets. Describe the planet. One interesting thing about the planets is that that is your setting in that particular scene or group of scenes. And so have them. you could have them discuss how does that setting – contribute to the story at that point. So like the planet Hoth at the beginning of Empire Strikes Back. They're on this cold, icy, freezing cold planet. Well, if we want to get Luke Skywalker stranded somewhere, then on a cold, freezing, icy, cold planet, it's a good place. Otherwise, he probably could find his way. You know, he grew up on Tatooine that's hot, so put him in a cold place. Um, and then you can have icy monsters, and, and you have white, and you can do all this kind of blizzardy stuff. So what is it about the planet that supports, as a setting, supports the story at that point? Um, that's something they can discuss as they describe a particular planet. Um, they can discuss or, or they can describe a droid or a group of droids or um, robots or the different um, characters that are um, not life-driven. They're some robotics. Um, the weapons. Boys are going to love that one. The weapons. Describe the weapons. What's a lightsaber? Why are they all different colors? Is there any representation to the colors? Um, how does the lightsaber work? Uh, why do they have those for training? What's so elegant? One of the scenes, I think Obi-Wan or somebody says an elegant weapon. Um, and what makes it elegant? Um, then there's all sorts of other weapons. I mean, Han Solo has his pistol. Um, you've got the Death Star, right? And four and five, four and six. And um, you've got the Star Killer base in seven, that newest one. Um, in eight, you have dreadnoughts. So then you have spaceships. You have your Imperial ships and your um, the what they dreadnoughts. You have all of the fighters. So you could go from so pick a weapon. I want you to describe it and describe what it looks like. Describe how it works. Describe who uses it. Um, and even discuss. Uh, you know, is there when they, like in the one scene in, in the most recent one, number eight, they show the, the um, Snoke's ships show up against all these Imperial ships. Now, in all the movies up until this one, the Imperial ships were enormous. Those were the big bad guy ships. And then they bring on Snoke's ship, which is like 50 times the size, right? So there's something representational about this, that um, when you look at the weapons or the technical um ships and things that they fight with, um, or the, the big bases and Death Star, like, what does that say about technology? What does that say about development and what, um, but even more just describing it. So it, it doesn't have to get into a really analytical place, but more of a descriptive place. Um, you can certainly move all these to comparative at some point too. Um, describe what's your favorite thing about Star Wars and why? What's your favorite scene? What's your favorite quote? What's your favorite character? What's your favorite planet? What's your favorite movie of them? Any of those favorites 
describe. So tell me what it is, describe it, and tell me why. Why is that your favorite? There's some writing you can do. Again, Star Wars, I enjoyed Star Wars at six. So you've got a range of six to, you know, 66 love Star Wars. So you could do writing at any age, depending on where your child is, if they like Star Wars. So that's why I'm giving you lots of a wide range of ideas. Um, another description, the role of the Millennium Falcon, like that movie was, or that ship, uh, they make a comment in number eight, they hate that ship about the um, TIE fighters are all going after it. And she lures them away because they hate that ship. Why? What does that mean? What's its role? Um, so these are some of your descriptive ones. Now we get into comparison. You know me, I love comparing. I think it's a powerful beginning to analysis. Um, and so, my goodness, you compare everything. Compare weapons. Compare um, the good and the bad, like the, the, the Sith and the Jedi, which would be in one, two, three, I think. Um, the Empire and the Rebels. Um, the, oh, what's the name of the bad guys in the seven and eight? First Order. I should know my Star Wars stuff better. First Order against the Rebellion. Um, you compare characters. And maybe you compare, I think sometimes the best comparison are villains. So um, compare Darth Vader and um, Kylo Ren. This one fascinates me. I enter into as many discussions as I can on this topic because I think what they've done with Kylo Ren is brilliant. He is relatable, whereas Darth Vader wore this mask the whole time. He wasn't human. He, um, I didn't connect with him, but Kylo Ren, like, I like him. I'm rooting for him. Every chance that there might be a spark of good in him, I'm like, Choose differently, choose differently. Like on my 30th time watching the movie, I'm still rooting for him, right? I mean, so what has, what, how do we compare those? Now, Kylo Ren's hero is Darth Vader, his grandfather. So what are some of the things there that we could compare, similar and different, of two villain, villains? Now, it's easy to compare a good guy and a bad guy. You know, let's do Luke Skywalker and Kylo Ren. Okay, but two good guys or two bad guys, um, two Jedis, um, like Obi-Wan and Yoda, both mentors, both teachers. How are they um, similar and how are they different? Um, you could compare the actual movies themselves. What's the difference, you know, four and five, or even the three. So four, five, six, it came out first, or the prequels, and give some comparisons of those. Um, you could compare um, what I have in here. Oh, the worlds and the planets. Now, this one's interesting because it's a little less emotionally connected. It's not a character, but I looked it up, and I have, like, I think I have 10 planets here. Tatooine, Hoth, Alderaan, Coruscant, Naboo, Endor, Dagobah, Mustafar, Camarino, and Geonosis. That's 10 of the big ones. And they all have a different look, a different feel, a different purpose in the story. So pick two and compare them. And you could, comparison, sometimes we can stay really surfacey. I've talked about this before. So it's just how do they look different? How's the weather different? Like, you know, what's interesting in all these planets, they all have the same kind of gravity. <laughs> um, I think that's just convenient for filmmakers. But you have, all of them have air that you can breathe. I mean, in none of these do you have where they have to wear big apparatuses to move around. Um, so that's some similarities, but the difference is, and I dig into how are they used in the movie as setting? What do they, um, you know, why did they open number seven with Ray in a world that looks just like Tatooine, which is where we met Luke at the beginning of four? What was it about seeing somebody in that hot, deserty space that made us want to root for him? Was there, was that purposeful? Who knows, but we can speculate. Um, so you can compare those, compare their purpose and role in the film and the story as a whole. Um, what else? Oh, okay. So one of the really cool things, I don't know that they have made these for the very original four, five, six, but I have seen them for the prequels and they have them for the new ones. And that's the making of. And uh, in fact, if you buy seven or eight on Amazon, you can buy it with the making of right after. And you get to meet the director 
the producer, and they take you through like the documentary, a documentary essentially, a documentary of how the film was made, how the story was developed, how this world came to be. And so you could compare that, compare the directors. What was George Lucas like in number one and two when you see him he, and hear him talk about it to Ryan Johnson? It's very interesting, actually. Um, so if your child is all interested in filmmaking, then comparing those kinds of things is going to be really, really valuable and fun for them. So what's different about um, what those directors were focused on and what those directors brought to the table in terms of strength? And um, so that's some things you can compare. Um, even J.J. Abrams to Ryan Johnson, the new guys, what, what were their, you know, how were they different kinds of directors? What did they bring? What, what were some of the choices they made? You know, J.J. Abrams cast. So Ryan Johnson had to work with that, right? A director coming on afterwards works with some of the choices made earlier. Um, but if you watch carefully and listen carefully, Ryan Johnson actually challenged some of the choices made in the earlier six and um, in his dialogue and the way he brought to light things. I'm not going to steal the uh, moment, but it's fascinating. Um, okay, so some other filmmaking kinds of writing. Remember I say writing is not just running text. It can also be, it's anything that I use to communicate to you what I understand. And so storyboarding, huge, especially if your child's interested on in filmmaking. Have them look at, okay, I'm going to take a scene or a couple scenes of one of my favorites of the Star Wars. I'm going to storyboard it. So if I were the director... What might storyboards have looked like for that scene? This shot, this shot, this shot, this shot, this shot, and then what was going on? There's not a lot of courses out there that teach you storyboarding. Um, in fact, there might be a video or two here on YouTube. But in general, they're done prior. The, it's the director's way to communicate to the photographer. Uh, to the, they call them director of photography and their team. This is how I want to shoot this scene. So you have to figure out, this guy's in charge of the set, this guy's in charge of, he's doing lighting, and this guy, you got to figure out how to get the camera to move in a way that I can get this kind of shot and this kind of look. And um, so that's what storyboarding does. It's telling the story, seeing it visually in these little snapshots. But why not do it afterwards? So if your child's interested in storyboarding, have them do a scene. What might that look like? And um, just so you know, most directors are not artists, visual artists drawing. So their storyboards are very rough looking, and that's fine. Um, so your child doesn't have to feel like they have to be able to draw well to draw those. Um, another thing they could do is draw the costumes for a character, uh, especially if they like costuming. I did one, uh, uh, an episode a few back on sewing, and we talked about the costumes in their role. So this angle is saying I'm going to look at and draw out, let's say Padme and her costumes, and then I'm going to write a little kind of how does this, how do these costumes contribute to her character? Um, the kind of fabrics, the colors, the motion, the way things fell and moved when she walked. Why those? And what did that do to contribute to her character and to the story? So you can do all sorts of things from the filmmaking perspective of writing. Um, set design. So you pick a set and you go, okay, so if I were to build that, you know, the, the one in number eight that's got the big tree um, on the island, it's supposed to be where um, the original Jedi trained and all their texts were, like this was their, for thousands of years or a thousand years or whatever, this has been their home for um, the Jedi to study. Um, and he lights it on fire. If you haven't seen the movie, it's kind of funny. Anyway, um, what would that, so some of the writing could be, okay, if your child's into filmmaking, so let's take the scene. How would you build that? How would you do that? How would you, um, would you do it outdoors? Would you do it on a sound stage? How would you design this? That? So you could pick any scene and, and analyze it or d think about how you would execute the set part of that scene. Um, 
that's another filmmaking type of writing. So I've hit story, I've hit descriptive and discussion, I've hit comparison and filmmaking. Now I'm going to go into analysis, then we're going to close up. Um, analysis is really this. I'm taking something big, I'm breaking it down to pieces, I'm doing some comparing, I'm seeing relationships that are there, and then I'm trying to explain all of the things I've kind of discovered. The deeper things, the deeper patterns, the things I've inferred um, that are in whatever this thing is I'm analyzing. So in this case, like a character analysis. Um, if, if your child really enjoys watching the making of, I would say the number eight one with Ryan Johnson is well worth, I don't know, is it 19, 29, whatever dollars that you buy on Amazon. Um, he is so transparent as he narrates the like hour and a half of how he made this movie. And um, he talks about how he wrote and came up with the characters' journeys. Because the characters themselves were already determined and written by J.J. Abrams in the first one. And, um, and his team. So he was carrying them on. And how was he going to do that? And the questions that he asks and the way he starts, I'm like, wow, there is something to be learned from him about that. Um, but character analysis, what were the big changes? What, um, so his line of thinking is that every major and even minor, not, not, not super minor, but major and, and supporting characters should have an arc. There should be some journey they're on emotionally through the story. Because if some big things are going to happen, then these people are all going to be affected. And so if they're going to be contributing to the storytelling, then there's some piece of something that they're having to overcome or that they're investing in themselves. So he starts with that premise. And so he went through all the characters and he wrote, what do they most want? I mean, and he's just, I'm going to let you write that. But the characters, doing a character analysis. Um, you could look at, I think, studying Luke from where he was in number four, this whiny little farm boy who wants to go play with his buddies, to this Jedi that at the end of eight, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, is willing to step up to be the legend everybody needs, but who he doesn't want to have to be and sacrifice his life huge journey he's been on and if you watch the making Mark Hamill who played the role didn't like that that's the way it was going um, but he chose to set that aside and commit to what Ryan Johnson had written and I tell you it's brilliant but you watch his change in number four and number five he's going to be trained to a Jedi and he is willing to stop his training short to save his friends and then six he comes back and he's willing to face off like the horrible job of the HUD and Darth Vader he has this hope and he I mean through the whole thing he's hopeful 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 and then you get him into now and he's lost all hope it seems and where's his journey now and you just look at this journey that he's been on there's some real interesting things you could dig around and write about with Luke Skywalker um Ray where she's coming from Kylo Ren I mean all these big characters um have very rich change and things they've faced that you could do some analysis with. Um, okay, I really like this one. The role of the female leads. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that I never, I never was excited about Leia. When I like imaginative play Star Wars in the backyard, I always had a lightsaber. So I was Luke. Um, and, you know, they didn't have any female, like, I mean, at the it, it, at that part of the story, there was only Obi-Wan, Yoda, and Luke that were Jedi. All the rest of the Jedi were gone. So we didn't even know that there had been female Jedi before. But I was, Luke Skywalker is playing that out. I never played Leia. Now, why? What was it about her character in 4, 5, 6 that was not inspiring to women? She was a sex symbol. Like, men admire because they're like, ooh, the gold bikini, right? That's how she was pictured, this sex symbol. Now, you talk with Carrie Fisher, and she, she wanted it to have an arc. She played the best she could, but what was written there was not a strong female lead in terms of character and what she was inspiring in girls. But what they, what they did with her in 7 and 8, though, 
was brilliant. They really brought her around to be an inspiration. But Ray, on the other hand, man, every little girl I talked to is like, yeah, it was Ray for Halloween. Yeah, I, I love Ray. I love Ray. I love Ray. Right? Um, they brought female leads in terms of strength and what she's willing to face and overcome in her own hope. Just brilliantly done. So to write an analysis comparing the female roles. Now, what were the female roles in one, two, three? You had Padme, right? So if you looked at them in terms of when they rolled out year-wise and what was the culture in America, you've got Princess Leia, then you've got Padme, and then you've got Rey. So an analysis with that could be very interesting, especially if you have girls that are interested in Star Wars. Have them dig into that. Um, okay, I just have two more. These are some why questions in terms of analysis. So why was the audience disappointed by one, two, three? Now, I'm not saying they hated them. I'm not saying they never watched them. I mean, I have seen one, two, three, 40 times, 30 times each. But I've seen four, five, six, and the hundreds of times. Like, it's one of those movies that I'll just put on and let go while I'm doing stuff. Or I would sit and watch it when I'm sick. I mean, some of those I watch over and over and over and over and over again. Not necessarily one, two, three. Um, why? What didn't fans like about those three movies? Why do you think those were a disappointment? Um, so analyze that. Another analysis, and I'm going to end with this. Why do you think Star Wars has had such an impact on our culture? It's been around now for almost 40 years. Actually, it has been 40 years. Um, because last year, Star Wars came out the 40-year anniversary. 77 to 2017. That's huge. Why was Star, has Star Wars had such this kind of impact? Dig into that. What is it about the characters, the worlds? You know, I realize that it was ahead of his time. George Lucas was ahead of his time. The technological aspect of what he shot and how he shot it. But that's not what won over hearts to Star Wars. You know, I was six. It didn't matter to me that he had the Millennium Falcon in a green screen. Like, you know, what mattered to me was what? These characters. Now, in a galaxy far, far away, right? Like, not Pluto. We're not on a planet that I know of. We're in a totally different place. You have humans. You have all this. You have the same kinds of struggles. I mean, so dig into that a little bit. What? Why do you think it had that impact? All right. Oops, I forgot to show you this one. Star Wars Attack of the Clones. So this is specific to movie number two. Um, it's a visual dictionary. But these exist. So if your kids love Star Wars, Costco has these all the time. And sometimes they have them that are now for all the movies versus just specific movies. Um, they have them about characters. They have them about the worlds. They have them about movie making. So depending on which part of Star Wars your child's intrigued by, whether it's the characters or the worlds or the lightsabers. And there's uh, also the whole Attack of the Clones, the animated stuff, which I haven't even touched on. Um, or whether it's filmmaking itself, um, whether it's a particular character. <clears throat> Excuse me. Look for some different books that you can find, even through Amazon, like used books. Um, garage sales have these all the time. Because, you know, someone had them for a couple years and then haven't used them again. And they're just great resources to do writing about Star Wars. Um, I hope some of these ideas are helpful for you and give you some things that you can go home and do or that you can go do with your kids. Um, this is looks like it's going to run about 40 minutes. So if you have a child interested in Star Wars, you can always watch this with them and see what things are interesting to them. And say, you know, she says something that... You think, oh, I'd love to write that. Write those down. And um, let them share with you what parts of writing about Star Wars might be interesting and exciting for them. Um, there is so many ways to work on writing with play. And Star Wars is one of my favorites. I can't believe I waited till episode 14 to do this. But um, other things had come up as higher priorities with from you guys. So I, I'm doing this one now. Um, yeah. So if you have ideas, feel free to share them in the um, comments section. And 
write questions if you have them. I would love to um, elaborate or even see some of the stuff you write or that you create from this. Um, it's a fascinating world and an exciting world, Star Wars is, and there's so much you can do to writing it. So keep in mind, we're awakening our learners by connecting to them, by finding things that they're interested in, ways that they play, ways that they, things they want to talk about, and then we're using that to improve their writing. Okay? All right. You guys have a great Thursday night if you're watching this now or a wonderful Friday or weekend. Okay? Talk to you later. Bye-bye.